Now, when King Amraphel of Shinar, King Arioch of Elisar, King Kedorlamer of Elam, and King Tadal of Goim made war on King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shanab of Adma, King Shemeber of Zeboim, and the King of Bela, which is Zoar. All the latter joined forces at the valley of Sidim, now the Dead Sea. Twelve years they served Kedorlamer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedorlamer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Raphaim at Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Suzim at Ham, the Emim at Shava, Kiriathim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. On their way back, they came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and subdued all the territory of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites, who dwelt in Hazazan Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar, went forth and engaged them in battle in the valley of Sidim. King Kedolomer of Elam, King Tadal of Goim, King Amraphel of Shinar, and King Arioch of Elazar, four kings against those five. Now the valley of Sidim was dotted with Bidumin pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah in their flight threw themselves into them, while the rest escaped to the hill country. The invaders seized all the wealth of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, and his possessions, and departed, for he had settled in Sodom. A fugitive brought the news to Abram the Hebrew, who was the dwelling at the terebinths of Mamre, the Amorite, kinsmen of Eshcol and Aner, these being Abram's allies. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he mustered his retainers, born into his household, numbering 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. At night, he and his servants deployed against them and defeated them, and he pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the possessions. He also brought back his kinsman Lot and his possessions and the women and the rest of the, and the, rest of the people. When he returned from defeating Kedorlamer and the kings with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, which is the valley of the king. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of Hoa, the most highest of hosts. He blessed him, saying, Blessed be Abram of Hawah, the Most Highest, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most Highest of hosts, Hawah, who has delivered your foes into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I swear to Oh, wow, the most highest of hosts, creator of heaven and earth. I will not take so much as a thread or a sandal strap of what is yours. You shall not say it is I who made Abram rich for me. Nothing but what my servants have used up as for the share of the parties who went with me. Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their share. All praise to the most high. Lao, oh, wow talking section 107 of the copyright act a little criticism comment teaching scholarship and research you know how we do it episode number 45 all praise the most high we're just staying in check searching for the Melchizedek nothing more nothing less because you are now tapped in with dragon canoe and we are steadily rowing and we are constantly flowing. We're going to jump right into it. We're going to take our time on this one. But I think it's due time that we revisited this information 
Let's go. Episode number 45. All praise the most high. We're talking the Atlantic Ocean, Tuscanelli's map, 1474 over a present day map of North America. We're talking the legendary island of Sapangu, Antilia. Keep that in your mind. Katai, Manji, and within the province of Katai and Manji are these cities, Kinsai and Zaitan. And get some orientation, talking Lisbon, hear what Portugal, Spain, what we know to be Africa. Again, this is the Roish map. We're talking the legendary city of Tangu, Manji. You see listed as Gog, Megog, King Tsai, Zaitan, and what we would know to be America today. We're talking Tangu, Manji, King Tsai, and Zaitan. This is what they would call Greenland, and to the west of Greenland is what we know to be North America. You let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comments. We're talking Tangoots were the predominant local power in what is now Eastern Gansu, Ningxia, and Northern Shanxi, they say. According to William of Rubruck, who traveled to various parts of the Mongol Empire in the 13th century, the Tangoots were valiant and had big swarthy men among them. Swarthy, adjective, swarthy, swarthiest of a dark color, complexion, or caste. You let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comments. Is America the real Tang Duke, home of the Grand Khan? Arontius finds map 1531. Asia as what we would know to be Mexico and the Gulf Coast. Katai and Manji. Katai, the legendary province of Manji. Let me know what you think. We're just connecting the dots here, staying in check, searching for the Melchizedek names of China, Katai. At the top, Katai. Another one of Orontius finds map. We're talking Tangut, Katai, Manji, and what we would know to be America today. With this being South America, the Gulf of Mexico here, Manji, Katai, Tan, Goot. I can't make this up. Were all these old maps just wrong or are we missing some pieces to the puzzle here? We're talking Genghis Khan, a painting from V.S. Smirnov, 1883. Look it up V.S. Smirnov, the famous Russian painter who came from a royal so-called Russian family. Batu Khan stabbed Prince Michael of Chernigov to death for his refusal to do obeisance to Genghis Khan's shrine in the pagan ritual. Note that Genghis Khan is depicted as a black man. Again, I cannot make this up. If you let me know what you think, leave a note in the comments. The vast steppes of the Mongolian plateau have from time immemorial been the setting for bitter struggles between the Turkic and the Mongol Tungusic pastoral tribes, they say. And the Katans ruled the area and founded mighty empires. We're talking Prester John and the Black Katan. But these empires did not endure. Mastery of the steppe changed, but some of the conquered races remained in their old homelands forming a substratum in the confederations of the conquerors and adopting the name of the victorious races. Ethnic and linguistic dividing lines became increasingly blurred. Let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comments. Two things can be true. Who are you, O oh Jacob? In the 12th century, mastery of Western Mongolia passed to the Naimans. The Mongol name for a group of the Turkic tribe, Sakis Oguz, or the Eight Oguz. 
when the Kyrgyz defeated the Uyghurs in 840, the Namans, who remained in their homelands in the Altai Mountains, attached themselves to the victors. They also drove the Karaites from their hereditary lands. In face of these attacks, the Khatans moved to northern China, they say, where they founded the Liao Dynasty. We're talking Liao Dynasty, the so-called Black Khatans. The Namans adopted Buddhism from the Uyghurs, but Nestorian Christianity also made some inroads. Keep that in your mind, Nestorian. The Namans were heathens, they say. William of Rubruck, we're talking Swarthy Tangus, William of Rubruck, who traveled through the same area, however, says that they were Nestorians. Certainly Kuklug, son of the name in Tayan Khan, was originally a Nestorian, being converted to Buddhism only after he fled to Karkata. The Naaman rulers had a reputation as great magicians of associating with and having influence over demons, they say. It doesn't get more fantastical than what we're reading right now. Baruch Khan of the Namans, for example, attempted to use his powers as a weather sorcerer on the battlefield of Khoitan. So you let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comments. Who are these so-called Nestorians? What is the difference between Orthodox Christianity and Nestorian Christianity? From the Orthodox point of view, Nestorianism therefore denied the reality of the incarnation and represented Christ as a God-inspired man rather than as a God-made man. So Nestorianism doesn't follow the viewpoint that Christ is the son of the Most High God and that he is merely inspired, not made are there any Nestorians left? The Christian church in Persia adopted it largely to obtain the protection of its rulers by assuring them that its religion was not that of their enemies, the Romans. We're talking Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Nestorianism continues today with groups being found in North and South America. November 29, 2023. Let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comment box. East of the Namans from the Orkhan in the west to the Onan and Carolan rivers was the extensive empire of the Karaites. The origin of this people which, after the collapse of the Ming Ku Empire in the 12th century, exercised suzerain suzerainty over the largest part of eastern Mongolia. Tao Zongyi regards the Karaites as Mongols, they say. Rashid ad-Din is less categorical. In his history of the tribes, he does comment that they belong to the Mongol nation, but he places them in a subgroup with the Namans, the so-called Nestorian Namans. He places them in a subgroup. You got the Namans, the Uyghurs, the Kyrgyz, the Kipchaks, and other Turkic peoples, they say. And Genghis Khan speaks only of resemblances between the Karaites and the Mongols. The names and titles of the Karaite rulers are Turkic. Toril is the Mongolized form of the Turkic Torul. Torul's father and grandfather before the Turkic title Buruk or commander. The title, again, the title of the Karaite princess Dokuz Khatun is Turkic as the title Yellow Khan, under which one Karaite leader is known. An important Kyrgyz tribe bears the name Karai, the Turkic element of Karaite. So again, we're just connecting the dots, staying in check, searching for the Melchizedek. Such a hypothesis would explain the condescension shown by the Karaites toward the Mongols which would then, as Grouse is suspected, be based on racial prejudices. So again, what are we talking about here? More on more. War. Shout out to Drop Nation for putting me on this pathway. We're talking Mongol Khans. 
In these new surroundings and in contact with the Mongol tribes, the Karaites quickly became assimilated. When the Naamans drove back the Katans, not all the Katans followed, some attaching themselves to the Karaites. The Karaites accepted the Nestorian faith again that Christ was not a God-made man rather than a God-inspired man. By the end of the 11th century at latest, although a letter cited by Abul Faraj, commonly known as Bar Hebraeus, reports the conversion of the Karaites as early as 1009, Karaite may be an interpolation and Togrul's father and grandfather bore the Christian names Marcus and Kyriakis. The Karaites, like the Naamans, were of a higher cultural level than the Mongols. They had a royal family and an organized military structure. We're talking Hebrew royal family here. So-called Nestorians. The Karaites, like the Naamans, were of a higher cultural level than the Mongols. We're just connecting the dots. According to Nestorius, Jesus is the union of two persons, a human person and a divine person. This is not a union of essences, key, this is not a union of essences, but rather a close moral union. In other words, Nestorius believed the union was not such that we could say the humanity of Jesus actually belongs to the Son of God. Again, inspired man. Nestorianism rather than a God made man. This is not a union of essences, but rather a close moral union. What did Nestorius believe about Mary? He insisted that Mary, as a human being, keyword, as a human being, could give birth only to a human being and not to God. He persisted in calling the Virgin Mary Christotokos. This teaching jeopardized the salvation of the human race, they say. So you can't have Nestorians running around saying that what the Catholics and Christians believe to be the utmost truth in your salvation. Basically saying that he's not who he says he is or not who they say he is. You let me know. Leave a note in the comment box. The Karaites also maintain friendly relations with the Catans. And it was in Karakatai that Torul took refuge. There was enmity, however, with the Naamans who had driven the Karaites from their traditional areas, also with the Tartars who had handed over the Karaite king Marcus to the leader of the Jerkin. This enmity was exacerbated by political rivalry. After the fall of the Ming Ku Empire, the Karaites, whose homelands lay on the Onan, According to the Persian history of Jun's Jani, were subject to the Karaites and one other Turkic leader. So again, we're talking about paying tribute. In olden times, the Tartars were the most powerful tribe in eastern Mongolia, they say. Their name was recorded as early as the Kul Tegin inscription, as the collective name for all the tribes and races of Central Asia. So they're saying the collective name for all the tribes and races of so-called Central Asia will be considered to be Tartars. The Tartar nation consisted of some 70,000 households, they say, perhaps some 350,000 individuals. According to Rashid Ad-Din, that the area was rich in silver from which they fashioned tools and utensils. The secret history tells not only of the silver cradle with a pearl encrusted quilt, which Temushin, aka Genghis Khan, carried off after his raid on the Tartars, but also relates that Shigi Kutuku abandoned in the plundered area. The Tartars were the richest of all the nomads and had exercised power over the majority of the Mongol tribes but quarrels and enmity were rife among the princes of this rapacious and bloodthirsty people, they say. In the 12th century, the Tartars served and paid tribute to the Qin emperors. So although the Tartars was running, going crazy on all the other nomad tribes, they still had to pay tribute to the Qin emperors. So we're talking hierarchy here. 
The pastoral tribes of Eastern Mongolia were constantly exposed to plundering by the savage and warlike Merkits, and that and they tamed reindeer as if on horseback. So imagine them riding around on reindeers. We're talking super fantastical, mythical type situation. Rock Hill, who points to their Turkic origin, currently challenges the assertion by Rubruk that the Merkits were Nestorian. Again, Nestorian. So the Merkits had rebelled against the Liao emperors and had been defeated. Some of them therefore attached themselves to the Katan prince, Yaliu Taishi. Close to Lake Bakal lived the Orates and other forest tribes. The forest peoples clung to the old customs. The shamanist faith survived longest amongst them, their shamans enjoying the highest reputation among the nomads as soothsayers and healers, where the rulers usually bore the title Beki, as in Toktoa Beki, Toktoa Beki of the Merkits and Kuduka Beki of the Orates, the title indicating that they were arch priests again cannot make this up we're just staying in check searching for the mail keys Zadek, man. let me know what you think leave a note in the comments some of genghis khan's forebears belong to the forest peoples having been given the demeaning sobriquet hoi yin ergen or forest people when the descendants of nekun taish nekun taishi a grandson of kabul khan and the brother of Genghis Khan's father, Yesugai. Again, the so called forest people. The Russian historian Vladimir Stoff believes that the dividing line between pastoral and forest peoples was not firmly demarcated. And Rashid Ad Din comments that every tribe living near a forest was regarded as belonging to the forest peoples. So the forest people get a bad rap, but in all reality, everybody was forest people. What if you live next to the forest? So they say, in contrast, plunder tribes were forced to adopt the life of a forest tribe as Yesagai's family after his death, living like the forest people and feeding themselves on wild berries, birds they had shot, and by fishing. Thus, the main factor in the struggle for supremacy on the steppe was not simply socio-political. So you got some other contributing factors that indicate hierarchy or supremacy in the mongolian steppe basically saying some were casted higher than the others the end of the 11th century saw the emergence in eastern mongolia of a nation which was to become known by the name mongol or mongol or mongol mingu in chinese source they say at the time of genghis khan the mongols it should be noted still describe themselves as Tartars. The occurrence of the terms Mankul Ulus or Mankul Urgin in the secret history does not, however, contradict this. The work was not written until after Genghis Khan's death when the term was applied retrospectively to the early days of the Mongol Empire. The origin of the Mongol nation is usually traced back to the Ming Ku or Ming Wu. Kabu Khan gave the name Mankul to his confederation in memory of an old and powerful nation or tribe. Connect the dots. An old and powerful nation or tribe. Li Xinxuan reports the Ming Wu lived to the northwest of the Jerkit during the Tang Dynasty. They formed the tribe of the Ming Wu. The people are strong and warlike. They can see in the night. They make armor from fish scales and in order to protect themselves from stray arrows and saying they do not cook their food. We're talking straight predators here. They can see in the night. Although this last remark is quoted word for word, the latter comments that the practice of cooking was gradually adopted by the children born of women who had been abducted by the Mongols in raids against such people as the Katan and Han. They are eight feet tall, hunt, and eat the flesh of wild deer. 
They can identify the smallest object at a distance of dozens of li because they do not smoke. They say. We're talking real life predators type. Ming Wu. They are eight feet tall. In addition, that the Tartars were warlike and subsisted only by hunting, that their land had no iron, and that they therefore fashioned arrowheads from bone, much like the so-called nations of North America when the conquistadors came over here. They had no iron. They fashioned arrowheads from bone. The Liao were the first to institute barter markets with them. Although the Tangu Empire also carried on barter with the Tartars and the Ming Ku, but firmly forbade the provision of iron to them. After the relaxation of this ban on trading iron, the Tartars began to produce military equipment. So the Tartars, they weren't getting no iron and no one was going to sell it to them until eventually they, for whatever reason, became more relaxed and then they let the Tartars start doing their thing. And the Tartars just built up an army. The Kidan Gaoshi, saying the Minguli people have no ruler and no chiefs. That in the olden days, the Mongols never had a leader who ruled the whole nation, each tribe having its own princeling. They have no agriculture. Hunting is their primary occupation. Following the seasonal supplies of water and pasture. Their food consists of meat and mare's milk. They do not fight with the Catans, but exchange with them cattle, sheep, camel, horses, also leather. And wool products, we're talking wool, like the Vicuña wool they found in South America. Just connecting the dots here. Staying in check. Searching for the Melchizedek. The shaman Teb Tingri reminded the sons of Genghis Khan of these olden days with the words, Before you were born, the stars turned in the heavens. Everyone was feuding. The earth and its crust had moved. Had moved. The whole nation was in rebellion. Rather than rest, they fought each other. In such a world, one did not live as one wished, but rather in constant conflict. There was no respite. Only battle, there was no affection, only mutual slaughter. Yesugai was an aristocrat of the steppe. Although Genghis described his father posthumously as Khan, this was never a title which Yesugai held during his lifetime. So Genghis Khan thought his father was a Khan, but Yesugai never was a Khan. He never held the title of Khan. Yesugai eventually acquired a certain power because when the Karaite ruler Torul was driven from his kingdom, Yesugai helped him to regain the overlordship of the Karaite tribe. In gratitude for this assistance, Torul swore blood brothership or Anda with Yesugai. So Genghis Khan's father Yesugai and Torul, the Karaite ruler, created a blood brothership. Basically, they formed an alliance with each other. Ho Alun bore a son at the time Yesugai returned. She gave birth to Genghis Khan. Sources claim Tamushin was clutching the state seal, and thus his father named him Tamushin. So Genghis Khan is a title. My man's real name is Tamushin, the son of Yesugai. It is not known when the legend arose, nor who was responsible for spreading it. Other legends concerning Temushin's birth also circulated among the Mongols, believing that Temushin was not created from human seed, but by a ray of light, they say. And through the roof light of the tent and announced to the mother, conceive and you will bear a son who will be a world conqueror. The chronicler adds that this legend was related by Kutun Noyan, a Mongol of the highest position. So they say in according to Mongol legend, Temushin, aka Genghis Khan, was born of a ray of light, they say. Night after night, a golden glittering man entered through the skylight. When he left, he crawled away like a yellow dog on the sunbeam or moonbeam. We're talking about the dogs of heaven here. A yellow dog on a sunbeam. The Liao Shi 
relates that the mother of Abauji, founder of the Katan dynasty, also became pregnant after she dreamed that the sun sank into her lap. Let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comments. In accordance with an old nomadic custom, what was also known in ancient China, Yesugai gave the newborn child the name of the captured Tartar chieftain. So, Genghis Khan, whose real name is Temujin, is so-called named after a Tartar chief. And some would say Temujin received his name because he was a smith, Temurshad, or belonged to a family of smiths. Although Lo Zan comments that the choice of Temujin's name is partly attributable to his cradle being made of iron, it is certainly striking that the names of Temujin's brothers, Temuj, and his sister, Temulun, also derive from the root Temur, meaning iron, saying he came from a family of smiths. Acceptance of the earliest postulated date of 1155 would lead to the conclusion that Temujin only became a father at the age of 30. He would not have subjugated, again, subjugated the peoples of Central Asia, they say, and undertaken his campaigns against the most powerful and civilized states of Asia. Well into his 60s, withstanding climactic conditions which the Mongols found very innervating, and at 72 he would have personally led the campaign against the Tangus in 1227. The Liao Shi points out that such exchanges of belts and horses were common among the Katans, the exchange of articles of clothing being of particular significance. The Chinese term for blood brothers was Pao Shi, or clothing brothers. We're talking brothers of the cloth here. Again, we're just following the drinking gore, staying in check, searching for the Melchizedek. It has been suggested by Dorfer that the conclusion of an Ander relationship required at least a symbolic degree of communal life. The Mongols entered into marriage at an early age, a means of forming alliances and increasing the reputation of the family. There had in any case been from time immemorial marriage alliances between the Mongol ruling house and the Angarot, one of the most important of the Mongol tribes, whose lineage, according to the stories collected by Rashid ad-Din, could be traced back to Mongol warriors who took refuge in the Erkin Kun Mountains. So again, there's so-called certain lineages, we're talking the line of Melchizedek, certain lineages, right, and alliances that date back a very, very, very long time. The motive for Bechter's murder. Excuse me, the motive for Bechter's murder was undoubtedly more fundamental than mere theft of a fish. Temushin's acceptance as head of the family was at stake. So they say that Genghis Khan, aka Temushin, murdered his brother Bechter. And that Yuan Shi reported that Belgatai particip participated in the election of Monkey Khan in 1251. He could therefore have been born between 1155 and 1165, and thus, according to our chronology, have been older than Temushin himself. So, uh, all I can say is uh, Temushin and his brothers and family, it wasn't sweet. Temujin, the eldest son of the senior wife of the head of the family, regarded the act as an infringement of his privileges and exercised his right to pass judgment. On guilty family members. Bechter's behavior indicated that he was conscious of his guilt and Belgatai did not seek to avenge his brother's execution. So he remained a faithful follower and of and received high honors from Genghis Khan, who is reported to have said, Is it it is to Belgatai's strength and Kesar's power as an archer that I owe the conquest of the world empire? All the while Genghis and Belgatai. Uh, participated in the execution of their brother, Bector. It's going down in Prophet's town. In the secret history, the account of Temushin's capture by the Taishayu follows directly on the episode of Bector's murder. A relationship between Bector's murder and Temushin's captivity had news of Temushin's deed come to the ears of Tarkatai Kiltuk, 
one of the leading princes of the Taishayut and was Temushin to be punished for. So now they're saying that when Temushin went into captivity, saying it could have had to do with the murder of his brother and the prince Tarakai Tarakutai Kiltuk took him as prisoner. After his capture, Temujin was treated as a criminal prisoner. Temujin was obviously held prisoner on more than one occasion. Young boys used, were carried off as servants or followers. Torul, ruler of the Karaites, was kidnapped twice in his youth by the Merkits and by the Tartars when he was 13. Also that his brother Jagambu was captured by the Tangoots. But because of his intelligence and ability, he achieved high office in the Tangu Empire. So again, it's a family affair here. The accurate archer Kassar and the powerful Begotai, who could fell trees with one blow of his axe, they said. And Timushin did not go empty handed to offer his services. He had, after all, the sable cloak and regarded as the king of furs, a first class sable cloak, Marco Polo noted, costed 2,000 gold bezants as much as 1,000 even when made of only second class skin. So apparently, Temushin was king of the furs and his sable cloak was very valuable. And they sought out Toruil, leader of the Karaites. So Temushin, Kesar, and Belgatai, the brothers, all set out to find Torul, who had made an alliance with their father, Yesuga. And Torul was the leader of the Karaites. Torul was an important tribal chieftain whose empire stretched from the Onan River west across the homelands of the Mongols to the Chinese frontiers in the east. The respect which he was accorded by the nomads was due, above all, to his relations with the Qin Emperor, to whom Torul paid tribute. So again, even Torul, one of the most powerful tribal chieftains, still paid tribute to the Qin Emperor, but on whose assistance he could therefore rely. Torul had an eventful youth. At seven years of age, he was carried off by the Merkits, so-called Nestorians, they say who set him to grind mortar, and when he was 13, he and his mother were abducted by the Tartars. On the death of his father, Kyriakis, aka Marcus, or Torul, committed fratricide in order to gain the Karaite throne, but was driven out of the land by his uncle, the Gurkhan. In this plight, he sought refuge with Temushin's father, Yesuga. Cthulhu Khan warned Yesuga, it is not good to make friendship with Marcus or Marcus, aka Togrul. We have come to know his character. It would be better to seal an and a pact with the Gurkhan. He has a good and sensitive character while Togril murdered his brothers and stained his honor with blood. Yesuya did not heed this advice. He attacked the Gurkhan, drove him to flight, and reinstated Togrul. Togrul aka Marcus as ruler of his people. As Temushin now stood before Torul, he reminded him of the former friendship between Marcus aka Togrul and Yesuga. With these words Temujin handed Togrul the sable cloak. In gratitude for the black sable cloak I will reunite you with your people. In gratitude for the black sable cloak I will bring together again your dispersed people. Togrul's pleasure was unlikely to be feigned. He stood in need of truly faithful followers because he could not trust his family. His own son, Singum, as well as the Gurkhan, his uncle, having designs on the throne. By acknowledging Togrul, aka Marcus, as his adopted father, Temujin entered into a vassal relationship which assured him the protection of a powerful leader. So he's making alliances here. And Temujin paid regular youthful visits to Togrul and eventually the Unk Khan, the Wang Khan, the Prester John, took him into his retinue and kept Temujin close to him. This pact opened up a new phase of Temujin's life. His reputation arose. It was not long before Temushin had an opportunity to put his new relationship with the Karaite leader to the test. 
let's go episode number 45 all praise the most high we're talking Temushin Toguru Ankan Wang Khan. You let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comments. We out of here for this one. Hello. Oh, wow.